on Friday, as I'm sure all of you know, there were at least two, at least two, beloved women laid to rest in our nation. One, of course, everyone knew, former First Lady Nancy Reagan. The other one was unknown, I'm sure, to all but maybe one or two of us. Her name was Grace Engelhart. She was the last remaining aunt in the Reader family. Now Brent tells me that his brothers and sisters secretly called her the Little General. And she got that nickname when Brent's father was terribly sick. He died when Brent was seven years old. And Aunt Grace came to help. She marched up that long driveway and she said to her sister, Sonia, you tend to Ray and I'll take care of everything else, meaning the six kids and the animals. And she did too. She took no nonsense from any of them. Now I met Aunt Grace and Uncle Charles who, by the way, was a staunch Presbyterian, a few Thanksgivings ago when they were about 90. Charles was a gentle soul, and Grace was a force to be reckoned with even then. So, on Friday, Brent went to Ohio for that small funeral and discovered that there was only one other family she was a cousin from the other side of the family. And they hadn't seen each other since they were about six years old. And Brent didn't remember her, didn't remember Carol. She remembered him and the day she had visited his family at their small, small rural Connorsville home. Carol remembered the details of the day. She remembered that Brent had shared his erector set with her. He says, probably less out of generosity and more out of good manners. <laughs> and she remembered playing in the bar and laughing as Brent and his sister squirted each other with milk directly from the cow. <laughs> And Carol remembered that she had taken a kitten home with her that day and had named it Snowball. And then sometime later, something drove a wedge among the adults. Some argument, some unfortunate difference that they could not see their way to overcome. What a shame. And what a common story for families especially as years roll on. It's probably not something that's unheard of among families. Well, Paul's epistle, epistle to the Philippians is, as all of Paul's writings, among the earlier <coughs> records of our Christian family heritage. The passage is a rare bit of autobiography from Paul. And remember that his real name was Saul, named for the first king of Israel. He tells us that he is fortunate because he is a circumcised Jew, a Hebrew born of Hebrews. He has a pedigree. He is a member of the tribe of Benjamin, one of the two most beloved sons. Further, he is an educated Jew who lived a blameless life under the law. And he either seems to be boasting or confessing, it's hard to tell which with Paul, that he persecuted Christians under the law. That, of course, is his point. Sometimes our loyalties, our fierce loyalties, even loyalties that we believe are good, can lead us to do, in God's eyes, ungodly things. And could we really do that if we really belonged to Christ? 
gives us something to think about, doesn't it? Especially if those of us who believe that loyalty is a characteristic that is highly valued. And, and it is. Loyalty is highly valued. But there are so many things that life asks us to give our loyalty to. Uh, take just a moment and consider in your life the many layers of things that expect your loyalty to one degree or another. Let me help. Uh, let me name some in no particular order of importance. Your spouse, your parents, your children, siblings, other family, friends, job, country, church, sports teams, and there are no doubt others that have come to your mind. And can you see that inevitably there are times when your loyalty to one or more of these things is challenged by your loyalty to another of these things? Inevitably. And when those moments come along, they are challenging and they are difficult and painful. How do you sort that out? Well, Paul certainly had that kind of challenge. Paul thought his loyalty was always to God. But he only knew God through the written word. That's how he expressed his loyalty to God. And that loyalty brought him straight to persecuting Christians. He knew the word well, and no one could have known it better. But his knowledge of the written word, taken at its face, and even backed up with unwavering loyalty, resulted in what we can all agree, looking back, was ungodly behavior. Paul executed Christians. Now, what would we say today about someone who, caught up in religious fervor, gathered together warriors like himself in order to purify the world by killing Christians out of loyalty to the way they interpreted, interpreted the word of a divine being. Think about that. What would we call such a person today Got a name? I see some of you smiling. They're in the newspaper all the time. But we read his words regularly and take them sometimes over gospel. <laughs> Well, Paul tells us that Christ spoke to him on a dusty road one day before Paul's vision, actual vision, was taken from him. He received a vision of the glorified Christ. And had he been hard-hearted, he might, it might have been the last thing he ever saw in his life. But Jesus made it clear to Paul where his first loyalty needed to be. Paul's loyalty needed to be first and foremost to Jesus Christ, Savior and Lord. Not the specific written word inerrant. We need to think about these things because we beat each other to death with this book.
Paul accepted this instruction, this challenge, in a way, this rebuke. Paul had been overly arrogant. He had been blessed in this life, and he knew a lot. Knew a lot. But knowledge is only a part of the way to God. Some of us, like Paul, know just enough to be dangerous. What we haven't figured out is how to give ourselves our whole loyalty over to the risen Christ above all other loyalties. And that's a tough call. That's a tough one. This means Christ above spouse, above family, above country, above job, above religion, above friends, above, dare I say it even in Indiana, sports. Oh my goodness, no lightning hit. <laughs> now that doesn't mean that we have to sit in church queues all the time. It does not. It's not what it means. But it does mean that we are one loyal, integrated person in all that we do. One person that Christ would be honored to dwell within. Wherever we go, whatever we do, whatever we say. Paul had a lot of trouble with his first century family. He believed that he had been given a mission to do a new thing in the world for God. Without the work that Paul did throughout the world with the Gentile church, without Paul's writings, it's interesting to consider what the state of Christianity would be today. Paul's enemies those words I read you from verse 2, those harsh words, the dogs, the evil, do you know who they were? They were the Christians, the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. Talk about a family split. They were still working on the letter of covenant law. They still thought that to be a Christian, you had to be a loyal Jew first, circumcised, dietary laws. And that's what that little family battle was about. And they couldn't get past it. Well, they were working on tradition. <coughs> And they were working on reading covenant law and the battle. And tradition doesn't sound bad, does it? But it can be. Loyalty to some things that sound godly can end up being ungodly. So the only solution for this is to give ourselves over to the risen Christ. God is always doing new things. That makes it tricky. We can't get stuck like Paul was. We can't. We have to be constantly looking for Christ doing a new thing. Humans are better at divisions and separate loyalties than we are at coming together. It's that we, are, we, we find it easier. It's one of our sins. But as Christians, as people of faith, as God's people, we are supposed to be loyal first above all to God and God's new plans. We are supposed to be who God asks us to be, not according to the letter of the law or to our own interpretations, but by living like the model of Jesus Christ, taking Christ into our hearts, we are supposed to give ourselves over to the Savior, body and soul, living offerings to a living Lord. Christ wants us to belong to him. 
and life can be whole and bountiful and abundant and free if we accept his invitation. So let us, on this last Sunday in Lent, this last Sunday as disciples walking along that road with Christ, give ourselves over, body and soul, as individuals and as a church, and be able to say, we belong to Christ.